Good morning, everyone. Good morning, First United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us today for worship here in the park, or if you're watching at home, thank you for joining us. Um, we would like to um, say welcome especially to our graduates and to their families. Uh, today we'll be celebrating our graduate students from high school. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we also thank you all for joining us here outside. I can see you all found <laughs> the outskirts in the shade. Uh, we hope you stay cool today, and we're grateful that you decided to brave the heat to join us here for worship. Um, today, we also want to just set our hearts and our minds on celebration. Uh, we want to be joyful today. We want to um, acknowledge that Jesus invited us to be people who celebrate, uh, people who are joyful in all circumstances. So I just pray that you experience joy in today's service um, and going from here today that you would be inspired to celebrate every single victory that you encounter. Um, I don't have anything else to say. So would you uh, stand and join us for worship this morning? falls won't prevail 
The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't faced by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, we recognize that we are here in your house because it is your will, and it will always be your will. Lord, please be with the graduates as they start a new journey into life, Lord, and just fill them with the joy that only you have, the joy that you share with us and that we go out into the world and we try to shine your light. Lord, just help us to do that each and every day, to just touch one person and make their life a little bit better so that they may share your light with others and help us to spread that joy. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us. Lord, we recognize that we sometimes make mistakes, but Lord, you forgive us because we are human and because we ask for your forgiveness and we acknowledge that without you, none of this would be possible. Thank you so much, Lord for everything that you do for us. We ask in all your name. Amen. Won't you turn to each other and greet each other? And if you guys are having any problems in the back, I realize it's hot up front, but there's only so loud we can get it. So just wanted to let you know. But turn to each other, greet each other as safe as we as we can. Good morning.
special welcome to all our kids and congratulations to our seniors. Um, I just want to take a moment. Some of these students were in children's ministry with me for only a tiny short time. It was like maybe two months before they promoted to youth. Um, but I have been able to get to know them um, and watch them grow in youth group and VBS. So I'm going to embarrass them now and, and reminisce about those good old days. Um, Jackson and Emily were two of the best small group leaders for Vacation Bible School. Um, and I remember Evan when he was like maybe up to here on me. And he was helping Carrie Lynn with preschool games. So it was a lot of fun. Um, I didn't get to know Hannah and Hank until a little, a little later. But um, Hannah helped with VBS. I don't think Hank did. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. Um, Brock. <laughs> so I never told you Brock, but... Um, most of the time when you would sneak up behind me to give me a hug, I was in the process of talking to another adult leader and probably complaining about something. And you would come up with your hugs and then I would totally and completely forget about what I was complaining about. So I want to thank you, Brock. I just want you to know that there is a party happening right now. The kingdom of God is a banquet that God is inviting everyone to be a part of. And everyone means everyone. Everyone who is young, everyone who is old, everyone who is tall, everyone who is short, everyone who disagrees with you, and everyone who agrees with you. I'm sure you get the idea, but if not, I will probably bring it up again. God is throwing a party for everyone, one heaven of a party with an invitation from the creator of the universe, and the good news is that everyone is invited. So, let's party! Thank you. So yeah, um, we encourage those kids with those noisemakers to not make that a one-time thing. So there might be other times where you'd be invited to make some noise, and we expect you to make some noise. Uh, so we want to take a, some time to thank you for continuing to give to First United Methodist Church, um, and we invite you to continue to do so. Your gifts um, are super important for helping us continue to do what we do here. Um, so you are invited to um, go online at firstonsecond.org to give, or you can bring your givings into the church at 225 South 2nd Street. Um, currently, we are having some issues with our mailing system, so we are encouraging you to not send your checks in the mail. But we thank you for, for giving and faithfully doing so. Um, at this time... I would like to invite our high school graduates that we have here up to the front with me. I'm expecting to see six of you walking down here. <laughs> uh, and while they're making their way down, um, hopefully you all were able to pick up a sheet with all their pretty faces on it and it has a little bit of information about them, where they are graduating from, what their plans are for next year. Uh, they'll also tell a little bit about that same stuff here in a second, but uh, in case you wanted to take this home and frame it or something, uh, that's available for you. So, hi everybody. Hey, uh, so I'm going to say a couple things in a second, but first I'm going to give you a chance to share and I prepared you all for this already. And Emily, yes, way to go. Thanks for standing right next to me. Um, <laughs> it's the shade, yes and no. So while they're up here, I'm going to ask them to share, very simple, your name, where you're graduating from, 
and what you're doing next year, okay? Sound good? Give me a thumbs up. I'm Emily Strobel. I graduated from Cash's, and I'll be attending Immaculata University as a nursing major. I'm Jackson Stahl. I graduated from Cash's, and I'll be attending Westchester University to study music education. I'm Hannah Mills. I graduated from Cash's and I'm going to Lebanon Valley to study secondary education. I'm Evan Green. I graduated from Chambersburg and I'm going to PIA to become an aero maintenance technician. I'm Brock Wetzel and I'm graduating from senior high school. And I was thinking about going to the university as a uh, as an engineer. I'm Hank Stauffer. Ooh. I graduated from Cash's and I'm going to Westchester to major in mathematics. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, oh, a bag broke. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a little gift for you here from the youth ministry that you can dig into a little bit later here. But I do want to say just a couple quick things because um, this is a special graduating class for me personally, and I'll explain why in just a second. But every year around this time, I get to stand up not here in the park, of course, but in front of the church, and I get to talk about our graduates, and I get to say how much I love them, and how much um, I'm proud of them, and how much I'm going to miss them as they move on from the youth ministry. Um, and it's, honestly, it's truly the case every year, but this year, like I said, is going to be different because, for me, this is the very first class who were sixth graders when I started as a youth minister. So I've been, you've been, for the whole journey, for your whole journey in middle school and high school, for your whole journey in youth ministry, um, you've been with me. And that's, it's crazy for me to see you grow from sixth graders to 12th graders. And it's the first time I get to say that. <laughs> um, but I truly feel like I was learning with you guys the whole time, um, and I know I only get to experience like a fraction of your life with you in the whole grand scheme of things, but you all play such a huge part of my life, and I am so incredibly grateful for the ways in which you have taught me, um, how you've laughed with me, how you've struggled with me, how you've worshipped God with me, and how you have celebrated with me. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all for the ways in which you've uh, participated and done everything you do. You've had a huge impact on my life. You've had a huge impact on this congregation, whether you spent a small time with us or a lot of time with us. And all that time is noticed and appreciated. And we trust that you're going to continue to represent our church, to represent our youth group, to represent Jesus Christ with your next steps. So um, do you remember all those times where I said there would be a quiz at the end? Here it is. Quiz time. All right, just kidding. Um, but there is something. A couple of you, in April of 2015, you would have been almost done with your sixth grade years, and a couple of you were on a retreat with me at Mount Asbury. Uh, do you remember what the theme of the retreat was? Yeah, here's a hint. Do you remember what the retreat was called? I think... It was Evan, Emily, and Jackson were there, so you all three are off the hook. That's right, it was molded. Yeah, we discussed being jars of clay in the potter's hands. Uh, so in one of our sessions, yeah, I have a clay pot here. Uh, in one of our sessions, I took a clay pot and I s said how this clay pot represents who we are, right? And then I, s what did I do next? The cracks showed 
<laughs> yeah, I smashed it on the ground, right? And I said, this is how, this is what we are like with sin. We are smashed to pieces. Uh, but in the potter's hands, we are restored. And this is that clay pot that has been restored and put back together. And Jackson said it so eloquently. Um, when we have Christ's light shining in us, he does not completely fill in all the cracks. He leaves a couple weaknesses, you know, for his light to shine through. Um, so when Christ's light is in our restored selves, his light and his witness is stronger um, and brighter. So there are going to be moments in life that you feel broken, like you've been smashed on the ground. I'm sure you've experienced that, especially in the last year, in several different ways. But uh, we encourage you to remember that clay pots can be restored in the potter's hands. God may not completely remove those weaknesses, but he's going to shine through instead. Trouble might come in life. Uh, there might be times, again, where you feel smashed on the ground. And whether that happens in college, in future relationships, in work, in whatever you counter in adulthood, just remember that brokenness is not the end of your story. Weakness is just another opportunity for Christ to reveal his strength through you. God has given you family and friends who is always, are always going to support you and love you, and some of you will go to college together um, to continue supporting each other. But you are always welcome here in this place. Uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ are always going to accept you with open arms. So to you six, your classmates, your parents, your families, to your mentors, your friends, congratulations. We celebrate you and we celebrate with you today and we will continue to celebrate every single victory with you along your journey. Thank you for bringing me so much joy and for sharing the light of Christ with everyone you encounter. Will you all please join me in celebrating them by clapping and making your noise. Uh, at this time, I would invite all of you, um, I'm not done with you quite yet, I want to say a prayer for our graduates. Would you mind all just like extending your hands forward towards our graduates? And will you pray with me? Father God, we come to you this morning first with thanksgiving. We are incredibly grateful for the great work you have done and will continue to do in our graduating students. Thank you for surrounding them with people who share their love and support so freely and for guiding every single step along their way. Thank you for offering them grace when they fall and for teaching them how to get back up and continue running their race. We ask that you will continue to make your presence known to these students as they experience change. Though we have been forced to learn recently that change is inevitable, help them and their families to embrace change with open arms as it signifies a new and exciting beginning in their lives. Continue to reveal your plan to them and give them the wisdom and the courage to make decisions with you in mind. In moments where these graduates feel lost, alone, or broken, help them to seek you in simple acts of kindness and small victories. Allow your goodness to be evident to them in every step. Allow them to see how you continue to care for them and help them to celebrate and find joy in a world that does not often acknowledge the goodness in simplicity. God, again, we thank you for the ways in which you've molded these young men and women and will continue to shape them as you faithfully continue to shape us. Help us to find joy in you in whatever life change or new experience we encounter. And may all our lives be a testament to the way in which you provide us strength in weakness, in which you provide light in the darkness, in which you provide victory in the trouble. We love you and we praise you. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Um, but before we move on here in the service, I'd also like to take a quick moment to recognize that... Um, COVID happened to everybody, right? And this was quite a difficult school year for every single person involved in school. Everyone was required to reinvent methods of teaching and learning. Everyone was challenged beyond how they normally are to make it through the school year. There may have been bumps and bruises along the way, but you did it. 
In a few moments, you're going to hear me talk about the importance of celebrating every single victory, especially in our community of faith together. So I would like to invite every student right now, every student, every parent, every educator, teacher, to stand up with me, everybody, even if you just were up here standing. Every single student, parent, teacher, educator, grandparents, if you played a part in helping your students learn this year, uh, we want to recognize and celebrate you today as well because you, your accomplishment was awesome too in making it through this school year and you deserve this celebration as well. So let's give all of these people here a hand as well. I'm going to invite Hank to come and read today's scripture for us. Can I put it in here? Yeah. All right. Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The word of the Lord. you quickly pray with me here. Father God, we uh, again are grateful for our, our graduates and all of our students um, and everyone involved in this interesting school year this year. Uh, we ask that you would uh, continue to be with them as they move into maybe back into semi-normalcy, uh, but just help them to not take for granted what they will have and uh, help them to be able to be able to celebrate every single victory that they encounter along their way. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so this morning I want to start off this message by talking about the greatest debate that's currently tearing our country apart, participation trophies. Nah. In all seriousness, I don't want to get into much debate. I don't really enjoy conflict all that much. But I do want to talk about participation trophies for a second because, funnily enough, many people have very, very strong opinions about participation trophies. And if you don't believe me, a quick type into a quick type of participation trophies into a Google search will give you your answer. Uh, but simply put, if you are not aware, if you don't know, participation trophies are trophies that are awarded for participation. They are often associated with people in my generation or younger, uh, but the reality is that they were first introduced in the year 1922 in a local Ohio newspaper as a way to encourage kids to participate in youth sports. So the criticism they receive is that they decrease the significance of awarding a trophy for winners, and they inflate the egos and the sense of entitlement of kids. Uh, but the support, the other side, for them argues that they boost self-esteem, they encourage kids that simply showing up and trying is worthwhile. So my purpose here this morning is not to ignite this debate. Uh, I'm not even sure which side of the... I don't know which side I stand on, even, if I disagree or agree with them wholeheartedly. However, I will argue that there is a certain value in the idea of participation trophies, especially within the church and especially following this pandemic year that we just experienced. Allow me to explain. 
There is tremendous significance in celebration, whether it's a huge life accomplishment or something as simple as participation. Celebration leads to joy, and joy is a vital piece of our discipleship, as evidenced in Jesus' life. We should therefore recognize small victories as something to celebrate as much as we celebrate larger achievements. Unfortunately, celebration has become somewhat of a lost art in life and even in faith. Instead, we live in this society that is hyper-focused on busyness and perfection and excellence and productivity and this mystery word, success. And I think it's fair for me to say that there is an unhealthy obsession with these ideals. And I'm not saying that these are things that shouldn't be celebrated uh, in and of themselves, but an obsession with goals like these leaves no room for celebrating small, simple victories. It causes life to be filled with worry and regret. It creates a rift where one person's definition of success can diminish what someone else might consider a personal accomplishment. And understandably, this naturally leads to a society that strives hard for success. But because it is often all-consuming, uh, the typical cost of striving for the success is our mental health. So for a quick second, let's consider a couple statistics which come from Mental Health America's website. Uh, one in five people will experience a mental health issue in any given year. So that may not sound like a lot, but let's break it down pretty quickly. Uh, if we have somewhere around 200 people attending our Sunday services between this service and our following service, if we uh, have around 200 people on any given Sunday, that means 40 of those people have experienced or will experience a mental health episode this year. So simply put, every single year, you personally know several people who will experience some sort of mental trauma. And further statistics, further statistics show that 46% of Americans will meet the criteria for a diagnosable mental health condition at some point in their life. And half of those people, so about 25%, one in four, half of those people will develop conditions by the age of 14, before they're in high school. So this means that almost one in four Americans could be diagnosed with a mental health condition before their 14th birthday. And the most common of these conditions, which is anxiety disorders and depression, uh, on average, those symptoms, those issues begin by the age of 11 before kids are in middle school. So I don't want to drown you in statistics this morning, but these should be alarming to us. And these numbers continue to rise, especially among young people. But when we consider what was mentioned earlier about our obsession with success and productivity at the cost of celebrating simple joys and accomplishments, I don't know if we should be all that surprised by these numbers. Students are continuously bombarded at an earlier and earlier age the need for success. Straight A's, unyielding devotion to sports teams, partaking in every extracurricular activity, earning scholarships for college, working now to start earning money. The list goes on and on and on. And then these ideals then bleed into adulthood, taking pride in a 60-hour work week, not being able to take a week-long vacation, filling every single weekend with something different, earning a six-figure salary, on and on, you get the picture. Society says that we can only celebrate once we've achieved all these grand goals. But I want to argue that shouldn't we in the church be sharing a different message with each other? Shouldn't we be defining success differently than the world does? Shouldn't we be valuing each other's mental and spiritual health above worldly success? So we here in the church should be the ones to bring daily celebration and simple joy back into life. Every 50 years, back in ancient Israel, the Israelites celebrated what was called the Year of Jubilee. It was an entire year devoted to universal redemption. All debts were canceled and forgiven. Every slave and servant was released. All property was returned to its original owner. And everyone just stopped working for a year so they could focus on rest. It was a beautiful image of what God would do for his people through Jesus Christ. It was a full year of celebration and intentional recognition 
of God's gracious provision for his people. And so as Hank read in Luke 4 for us, Jesus began his public ministry by proclaiming the year of Jubilee. And in doing so, he called all of us to that perpetual state of Jubilee and joy. Throughout his ministry, Jesus continually revealed a release from captivity and called his followers to joyful obedience. He challenged everyone to look at life in a way that constantly celebrated the coming of God's kingdom. He encouraged people to practice joy and celebration by being freed from worry, by tying ourselves to a heavenly kingdom instead of an earthly one, and by reconstructing social arrangements and priorities. With Jesus, there is no prerequisite or specific criteria for celebration. Joy is simply a part of us and something that we should practice any and every chance that we get. In his book, The Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster discusses ways in which Christ follower finds joy in Christian disciplines like prayer and meditation and worship, etc. But he ends his book by discussing the discipline of celebration. And he declares joy as something that ties the other disciplines together. So in his book, he writes, Celebration is central to all the spiritual disciplines. Without a joyful spirit of festivity, the disciplines become dull, death-breathing tools in the hands of modern Pharisees. Kind of strong language, but uh, I think we'd all agree that we don't want to become people who can't find the day-to-day joys of walking with Christ. So let's look again at the actions of Jesus. I think sometimes the church, I think sometimes we subconsciously give off this impression of Jesus as a dull, stale, stern man who walked around with his nose up, scriptures in one hand, a whip in the other, and that's the Jesus many outsiders can see in the church. And so, understandably, they don't want any part of the church or him. But I think that Jesus had to have been a pretty cool, joyful, fun guy to be around. I mean, sure, there were moments where he clearly was very serious and intentional about faith and discipleship, but he primarily spent his ministry telling stories, eating food with other people, engaging in small group conversations, hanging out with 12 other guys, bringing others life and healing, generally just building connections with people. Wherever he went, there was life and joy and celebration. And if we are honest with ourselves, I don't think that sounds like what we do in the church all the time. So uh, Richard Foster goes on to write in his book. He says, it's an occupational hazard of devout folk to become stuffy bores. That should not be. Of all people, we should be the most free, alive, and interesting. Celebration adds a note of festivity and hilarity to our lives. After all, Jesus rejoiced so fully in life that he was accused of being a wine-bibber and glutton. Many of us lead such sour lives that we couldn't possibly be accused of such things. It was always Jesus' intention for the church to be a house of joy and celebration. Jesus engaged in social gatherings and atmospheres. In other words, he partied to the point that the Pharisees ridiculed him. When Jesus encountered Zacchaeus, a despised tax collector among the locals, he responded by inviting himself over for food. In the story of the prodigal son, Jesus explains how the father welcomes the sinner home, not with a telling off, but with an extravagant party. His first recorded miracle was turning water into high-quality wine at a wedding feast. He describes the kingdom of God with terminology of a great banquet and wedding celebration. So to assume that Jesus did not celebrate joyfully or on a regular daily basis and call his followers to do the same would be ignorance of scripture and misrepresentation of the gospel. So as disciples of Christ, we should therefore celebrate every day. And maybe that means we need to redefine success and achievement in a way that we can freely celebrate small victories as much as we celebrate huge life accomplishments. Common joys should be shared and celebrated fully without shame or without feeling like they are not worth celebrating. As we practice celebration, we are free to experience more celebration. Joy creates joy. Laughter creates laughter. So today, as you saw, we recognize and celebrate our graduate students. Completing high school 
is a major life accomplishment, especially given the events of the past year and a half, right? Uh, in the last few weeks and in the coming weeks ahead, you and your families and your classmates, you're going to celebrate with parties and feasts and ceremonies and awards, and rightfully so, right? We are tremendously proud of you, and we are honored. I am honored to be even such a tiny piece in your life. The purpose of this conversation is not to diminish major life accomplishments like these, but what I am trying to say is, as Christians, we have no reason to reserve celebration for once-in-a-lifetime events. We should practice joy and celebration every single day because that is God's will for our souls. My prayer for the graduates specifically here is that as they move on to the next stage in life, I pray that they would continue to celebrate every joy they encounter along their way. God has not failed you yet, and he will not fail you tomorrow either. You are entering a world where it is difficult to embrace simple accomplishments and small joys. So be a light unto others who may only be straining for that next huge success and losing hope because achievements are few and far between. Remind them that joy can be found among the sparrows and evidence of God working in our lives can be seen in the simplest of things. Now, I also think it's important for us to acknowledge that not everything is a celebration. And I'm not suggesting that we ignore negative aspects of life by instead putting on a happy face. Uh, we read in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus tells us, I have told you these things so that in me you have, may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus was very straightforward in telling us that we are not immune to pain and grief and heartbreak and stress and hurt. It's going to happen. And that's okay. When his friend Lazarus died, Jesus did not disregard the grief he experienced. He took time to weep, even though he knew what was about to happen next. So we should not encounter sorrow as if it isn't real and celebrate even in those uh, sorrow, sorrowful things, but we should instead acknowledge that we are people who know of better things to come. So consider this past year, as the wind plays with my notes. Consider this past year, of course. It has been really easy for all of us to point out the trouble and the sorrow that COVID created, right? Some of us had more difficult experiences than others, but all of us were challenged to look differently for joy in our day-to-day -day journeys. Some of us occasionally struggled to even get out of bed. And it's not our role to minimize or dismiss those struggles, but as a people who are free to celebrate small victories, we should joyfully acknowledge that things like getting out of bed was and is a major accomplishment for some people every single day. We are a people who can celebrate every moment that betters ourselves and betters the lives of other people. When we as a community of faith can freely celebrate victories, big and small, with each other, that's the kind of thing that's going to draw people to Jesus and draw people to his followers. It is healing and refreshing to approach life in such a way that we can recognize and appreciate simple joys and small victories. If our whole being is spent chasing after the best grades, the best paying job, the busiest schedule, the most newsworthy accomplishments, we become strained and weary and worried and negative. Celebration instead helps us to relax and enjoy the good things of the earth that God so graciously provides for us. This kind of celebration does not forget the struggle, but it allows us to believe that the struggle is not our story. That was the kind of life Jesus intended when he proclaimed freedom from captivity. So think about it this way, if you haven't been able to follow along or know where I'm going. Uh, think about it this way. If we are faced in life with many different staircases, the world looks at the top step of each staircase, and they say, celebrate with us when you get to the top. But we as a church, as a community of faith, want to celebrate every step of the way. Sometimes we only have the energy to climb up one step. Sometimes we are able to jump up two. And yet sometimes we trip and fall down a couple steps, but we can celebrate getting back to our feet and taking the next step back up again. Each step is a reason for celebration, not just the top step. Um, on Facebook, recently, 
I asked people if they would share things that they celebrated in the past year. So, of course, we're coming to an end, well, hopefully we're coming to an end of a time where joy is hard to come by uh, due to COVID, and we wanted to know what kind of victories people are celebrating, both big and small, through their experience of this last year. So here are some of the responses that we received. We received big celebrations like uh, an engagement, getting a new job, uh, a job promotion, becoming a parent and a grandparent, um, those are big things that should be celebrated, but we also experience small things that should be celebrated, like eating dinner at a restaurant, having church in the park, using technology to connect with family, watch, watching Hallmark Mysteries with my granddaughter, finding time to sit outside and enjoy a cup of coffee, attracting bluebirds to the yard. Simple joys like these, we are free to celebrate all of these things and more because Jesus has shown us how to live a life of joy and jubilee. We are free to point to these moments as evidence of God working faithfully in our lives. So there is value in a participation trophy in that, for some, participation is an accomplishment that needs to be celebrated. The Christian way is that joy can be found in the simplest of moments, in the smallest of victories. If we spend our days rejoicing and celebrating the life we have in Christ, setting our minds on the beautiful things that God has blessed us with, other people will find that sort of living meaningful and attractive. People were drawn to Jesus because of the love and the joy he revealed in his day-to-day -day living, and they will be drawn to his church by the way his followers celebrate the simple joys in life. Some days it is hard to do that, but we also find joy in the ultimate victory in Christ. So the question then for you all is this, how can you live your day-to-day -day life with a perspective of celebration? How can you develop a Jesus-like perspective on Jubilee? Will you pray with me? Father God, we ask that we would be people who celebrate and live joyfully every single day. We ask that we are able to uh, fully and genuinely celebrate with other people as they share their small victories with us and as we share our small victories with them. And that victory would be something to be celebrated, uh, big or small, because we have found ultimate victory in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Steve to come up and lead us in communion. One of the things that we regularly do as the body of Christ is that we share communion. And when we share communion, what we call it is we celebrate communion. Um, sometimes communion is called Eucharist. And uh, that word means uh, it has a part of it has to do with grace. Um, and part of it has to do with thanksgiving. Part of it has to do with joy. Uh, so it's really appropriate today that as we think about celebrating that one of the focal points of our life together as the body of Christ, communion, is something that reinforces this idea of joyful celebration. So I invite you to participate in this uh, celebration today as we share communion with each other. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread... And drink this cup. You proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. Let us pray. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you created heaven and earth and made us in your image. 
and kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and love and joy. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. If you take the communion elements that you have received and uh, pull back the, f the film top, revealing the wafer, and then take the wafer in your hand. The body of Christ given for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And now carefully peel back the second um, seal, revealing the juice. The blood of Christ that was shed for you to give you forgiveness of sin. Take and drink this remembrance that Christ's blood was shed out of love and be thankful. Let us pray once more. Loving God, we give you thanks that you have fed us in the sacrament, united us with Christ and each other given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom, and given us cause for celebration and joy this day. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Won't you rise and celebrate with us? Okay. Ready? All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. Winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises
sins are rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sins are rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, I see the evidence of the goodness. All over my life, all over my life, I see promises in fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life, yeah. I see the evidence of the goodness. All over my life. Whether you completed your school year this year, whether you're graduating high school, or whether this is just another regular Sunday for you, um, may you see the evidence of God's goodness in your life, and may you know that his promises are fulfilled every single day, and joyfully celebrate that. Go in peace. Why should I?